You all know Yashra, he's just a great uh, machine researcher, really um, created the, the world of Montreal machine learning and deep learning, and made it a center for deep learning, maybe the biggest one in the world now. Uh, and yeah, he, he won a turn award. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like the Nobel Prize. What is that recently? Yeah, uh, yeah just, just a couple months ago. And, um, but I think, you know, he's sort of been, you know, a deep learning supervised learning guy until recently I noticed he's expressing some interest in reinforcement. <laughs> and some papers too. And, and maybe, you know, the, 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 the pan Canadian AI strategy, it came really out of the east <coughs> end of the country uh, and the deep learning guys. And they were, uh, I think, very nice and generous to include reinforcement learning in the scope of that. And I do suspect that it was largely due to, to Joshua here. But we don't know. Uh, <laughs> Actually, it was. <laughs> <laughs> but, but also because we had a strong reinforcement learning contingent in Montreal. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and exactly. And all that exciting stuff. And because, and because the um, sort of the politics of just Montreal and Toronto together is not healthy. <laughs> So you bring in the third one. That's right. Yeah, good. <laughs> um, so, so it's, it's, it's really exciting, you know, as Joshua is, 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 is bringing his expertise and his, his, his whole, and whole of, uh, environment in to look at reinforcement learning and, and do some work in that area. And it's, I'm just really excited about it. And I want to encourage him and welcome here to Alberta. So please all welcome. welcome. Yeah. Um, so there will not be a lot of RL in this talk, uh, mostly because I feel that what we've been doing in my group in RL is still like baby steps as far as I'm concerned. There's so much I need to learn. That's why I spent so much time in the uh, RL part of the summer school this year. Um, and this, the, the, the literature is, is like crazy uh, big. Um, so it'll be more, I'd say, a perspective about the thing I really care about from the beginning, which is representations and learning representations, but inspired by what we need when you think about agents, right? which is what RL is about. Uh, and of course, this is all because I, I've been, since the beginning, motivated by the idea that machine learning could bring us towards AI. And maybe you guys don't know about this, but there's been a period in history where machine learning kind of forgot that. And fortunately, we're out of that woods. So um, a lot of the motivation that I had initially about uh, learning representations was that you know, I thought we could have multiple levels of representation with the higher levels corresponding to very abstract stuff of the kind that humans can uh, communicate about. So just, uh, I, I, I couldn't uh, attend the whole options lecture today, but you know, it, it's, it's about high level abstractions, temporal abstractions, all, all kinds of abstractions that um, we can be, uh, in some cases, conscious about, and we can reason about, and so on. And this is very different from the sort of stuff that deep learning and neural nets in the tradition, uh, in the, in the last few decades I've been focusing on, which is more like low-level representations, which is about perception, and it's about um, you know, thinking of this as features rather than thinking about high-level concepts that your mind builds up in order to do very complicated things, uh, including, um, I think, planning in a, in a, in a, in a more uh, powerful, than we are able to, powerful way than we are able to do today. And so, so yeah, I'm very inspired by this uh, System 1, System 2, System 2 division, in case you don't know about it. Um, uh, roughly speaking, uh, in machine learning, we've done a lot of progress with the, 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 the unconscious kind of uh, processing and not so much on, on the conscious side. And so I, I want to get closer to that. And it's, it's also what classical symbolic AI was trying to do, but failed. Uh, and, and I think now with the tools of machine learning, we have a, we have a chance of getting that actually working. 
but not in a way that's completely separate. So one of the mistakes of classical AI is to try to solve the, the reasoning problem and the model, uh, uh, doing inference in, in, in that level without grounding in the low level stuff. Um, and I think one reason why it's wrong is because the stuff we're conscious of is sort of the tip of the iceberg, but it sits on top of the stuff below and uh, it's a rough approximation. Like the actual really nitty gritty details are in this uh, uh, unconscious part of the computation. Um, but we also need that high level of things. And one of the things that in the last year or so I got really excited about is thinking about causality, counterfactuals, like being able to imagine things that are not even possible and it's useful. It's useful uh, because, well, you can enjoy a science fiction movie, but it's also useful because uh, it can help us to do credit assignment, like to figure out, well, what if that person had done this, right? And, and so there, there's lots of good reasons why we want to have something like a system two type of reasoning that can even uh, manipulate potential worlds that don't exist. Um, yeah, and, and of course the other thing where they connect is that the, the, the sort of uh, system two type of uh, reasoning is very slow and inefficient. And so somehow it needs to be compiled to system one uh, habits and intuitive behavior. Um, so this notion of multiple levels of representation is, is really important for me. And it's connected to uh, the idea that uh, so I've been working on generative models for many years, decades, and the typical way we think about generative models in machine learning is we want to generate like the next frame in a video or something like this. And that's not good. Uh, this is not the way my imagination works, right? I, I generate abstract stuff that can potentially be translated into pixels, but it's actually a painful process. Um, and so... Uh, so, so the way to do this is uh, instead of doing things like uh, variational autoencoders and so on where you, 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 your objective function is defined in pixel space, you try to define an objective function in the latent space. Right? Uh, so you want to learn generative models in that space, but you want to do it in a way that is meaningful, and it's not trivial to do that. Because if you're not careful, uh, say you want to, minimize, you ma you want to make uh, features in the high-level space predictive of each other, like say predict t plus one given t, but in the latent space. Then you can trivially make prediction error very small by learning a constant mapping, because then everything will be easy to predict, right? So you see that it's not trivial. So there's this potential collapse that we have to take care of. Um, and one thing we've been working on uh, over the last year is using information theoretical objectives um, based on maximizing entropy and mutual information to try to avoid that uh, by asking, for example, if we want to, instead of thinking about this should predict this, we're going to say we should have high mutual information between this and this. And so the difference between high predictability and high mutual information is entropy. In other words, we want to preserve information about the input in addition to have high um, predictability. So it, it sounds like it's a little detail, but uh, technically there's a lot of work that's been going on and it's spreading across in machine learning in many areas but I think for my big plan of uh, learning for example to uh, to plan in the latent space and um, uh, we, we're going to need something like this. Um, system 2 is also as I mentioned about uh, capturing causal relationships and counterfactuals and things like this um, and um, this whole notion of Building models of how the world works has been a motivation for a lot of us. Uh, but if you look at the current state of the art in machine learning, of course, a lot of it based on deep learning, we're very far from that. If you look at the kinds of mistakes that mis systems make, they, they, they show that the, what has been learned is still very superficial and the models kind of cheat by looking at statistical regularities. Um, so, so we need something stronger. So one direction that I've started thinking about a couple of years ago and is still uh, behind a lot of my current investigations is this idea of a consciousness prior that I'm going to spend quite a few slides talking about today. 
and the uh, sort of there, there are several angles to, to think about this, but, but one way to think about this is when we are going to generate like future frames in the, in the latent space, like, like this, uh, instead of generating, imagining all the possible things that can happen, we just want to focus on a few relevant things. Relevant for the, the agent that's uh, maybe planning or, or imagining things that could have happened. So, so this focus in uh, in s selected dimensions. Sorry, where, uh, I got lost uh, here. This focus on selected dimensions is similar to what you do with uh, temporal abstraction, where you focus on selected moments. But now we're talking about focus on selected aspects that you 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 want to be unfolding instead of unfolding the full state at each time step should think of unfolding at selected points in time, selected aspects of the, of the state at, at, at an abstract level, okay? Um, and so now we have to be careful because, well, if I'm only going to predict a few things, then uh, why should I, should I like, not learn to predict always the same stupid easy thing, right? So it's the same, same problems arise, and I think similar solutions may be applied as well. If you're going to be focusing on a few things, whether it's time or dimensions, you need a, a mechanism to do that kind of selection. All right? And we have the, the building block of that. It's called the tension mechanisms. And it's been incredibly successful in the last few years in deep learning. Um, we, we, we realized that we needed something like this for making machine translation work. But now it's everywhere in natural language processing we're using deep learning. And, and it's sort of expanding, and people are starting to use this in many scenarios. Um, and so I think this is going to be an important element. Um, it's also connected to the notion of what is a thought. And maybe people, maybe different people might have different interpretations, but the interpretation I have. The, the, the object that I want to think about when I, I consider what is a thought is a, a conscious thought. So it's, it's the thing that you're paying attention to at, at a particular moment. It might, might not be just one thing. It might be like a handful of things. You know, so there's the short-term memory notion in, in uh, psychology where you can hold like five to seven things uh, roughly in, in a thought uh, or at least close by. And, uh, and so you need, you need this, uh, this ability to select a few things that go into the current thought. And so I think of thoughts as low dimensional objects by, by opposition to a maybe potentially much higher dimensional object, which would be everything that you could think of, uh, but not, you know, not just thing that you're thinking of, but everything that you could, uh, so everything that's sitting at the high level. So I, I drew this little picture to help myself. Um, we have so the raw input, which you could think of a sequence. And, and then we have this high level uh, unconscious state. So it's high level in the sense that it represents the high level kind of factors that I want my machines to disentangle and discover and so on. And, and potentially there's a simple mapping between the stuff here and language. And, um, but at any particular time, I'm going to use an attention mechanism to select you know, s a few things from there. And then uh, the stuff that is currently conscious is going to have a very strong influence on everything that you know, further processing, like even potentially changing how you perceive. We know uh, there are uh, effects like this. Uh, potentially changing, of course, more importantly, changing your decisions, your, your actions. So uh, if you're thinking about something, you're going to act upon it very likely. So it's, it's a very central ingredient that I think is missing in a lot of current um, machine learning. OK. And I call it a prior. So I call it the consciousness prior. So what, what's the prior about it? Um, because um, because we, we have to hold a thought in just a few dimensions, it's a very strong constraint. It says that, um, let's, say, let's say a thought is a prediction about something. Okay, it's like easier to think about it. So if I'm going to predict something, 
Well, first I'm going to predict just one or a few variables given a few other variables. That's what it means that it is low dimensional, that you know, there is a strong dependency involving a few variables at a time. And that's a strong assumption about the world, at least when it's represented in, in that level. It's not clear that this assumption is always true. But it, it seems to be working really well for the kind of concepts that we consciously communicate about. right? And uh, you can see it by the fact that we are able to communicate those things in language involving little snippets like sentences that involve only a few words. And we can write things like facts and rules and stuff in classical AI that have this uh, property. From um, a uh, graphical model's perspective, one way to think of it is if you map the data to the right space, uh, then there is a joint distribution that can be represented in a very uh, compact way because the, the graph that relates all of these, uh, especially if you think of it as a factor graph, that graph is very sparse. So it means that the joint can be written as a product of, uh, of these uh, factors, and each of the factors involves only a small subset of variables. So, so that's, that's an assumption. Uh, and, and furthermore, you'd like, you'd like those, you think of these as like constraints. This is the way, for example, Jeff Hinton thinks about Boltzmann machines. Think of each of uh, these factors as constraints. It's saying, okay, so when this variable takes this value, this variable takes these or these two values, and, and these other values are not likely, right? So, so there's, it's making a statement about the things that are possible and the things that are unlikely. So for uh, you know, if I, if I drop this and I catch it, I can make a statement about I'm going to catch it. It involves very few aspects of the world, and, it's, and those state statements can be very, very strong. They, they, they can, you know, be true with very high probability. Um, and so I call it a prior because potentially this is a property of the high-level variables which can be uh, used to help figure out what those variables should be in the first place, among other constraints. All right, um, so now let me talk to things that are a bit closer to uh, thinking about agents. So, so one line of work which is related to this mutual information business, um, but, more, but closer to thinking about what agents do, is this uh, work we started a couple of years ago on um, relating uh, the representations of states and um, trajectories on one hand with representations of policies, skills, options, you know. So, so the idea was, would like, there's a different way to think about this idea. So one way to think about it is, would like these two representations to have a simple mapping between each other, basically again maximizing mutual information. So what is, what, is, what is it that maximizes mutual information between two sets? It's, it's like you create a bijection so that if, if, if you give me a, a, a policy representation, I can tell you exactly how it will change the world. And vice versa, if you tell me how you want to change the world, I will tell you what is the policy that does it. Right? So that maximizes mutual information. And of course, you, now you have to think of these sets and the distribution over representations of policies and representations of uh, states or trajectories. And, um, and the way I was thinking about it in intuitive term has, is, is related to notion of affordances that hopefully all of you know about already. Um, that basically objects are mostly represented by how you can, wh what you can do with them. And, uh, and so the, the, the connection here is um, if there is a, if, if I can cook up uh, a representation for a policy that will do change one particular aspect of the world, uh, like one dimension in my uh, state space, then that dimension is controllable. So it's connected to controllability, right? So there may be dimensions that are controllable and others that are less controllable and so on. So, so this idea of connecting the representations here also introduces the notion of how controllable, how, how much can I predict or how much can I you know, uh, do the things that I promised I would do to change the world. 
Um, and of course, it's connected to uh, exploration. We'd like to maximize controllability and all this. So there's lots of interesting connections here. Um, and there's a recent, there's some recent work uh, from um, the Berkeley gang um, that uh, does related things, and I'm sure several other recent papers are exploring things like this. Okay, now for whatever is left of my time, how are we doing? It's 4:30, so I'm going to talk more about things related to multi uh, to uh, non-stationarity. Uh, that agents encounter, but from a very simplified perspective, thinking about it like it, it's connected to all the previous discussion, don't worry. Uh, it's connected to causality, it's connected to uh, representation and high level representations, uh, but thinking about how we can turn something painful, like, oh, I'm an agent, the world changes, oh no, everything is, you know, I have to like relearn, into something useful something that will actually help the agent figure out better how the world works. Right. So this is, this is my promise here. And uh, it, I'm, I'm not saying like this program is completed, but we've made a few steps in that direction. So what's the idea? Um, in order to think about non-stationarity, changes in the environment, changes in distribution, you have to go a little bit beyond the traditional machine learning uh, theory which is all focused on thinking of a single distribution. So uh, it's kind of hard to do that because uh, if I have two distributions, well, I could learn them separately, um, but really that's not what I want to do. Um, I want to be able to capitalize on what I've learned from one to do something about the other. And so I'm going to need to make assumptions or the agent is going to have to make assumptions about the relationship between those different distributions that I'm going to encounter. Uh, and and meta-learning, which is a fairly recent development in machine learning, is all about that kind of thing. I'm going to be having meta-examples, which are samples from different distributions. Each meta-example is from one different uh, uh, distribution. And by looking at all of these different distributions, which somehow have something in common, I can discover something stable, which is going to be learned in my meta-parameters, stable parameters that capture the stationary part of the world. So, so the, the meta-learning way of thinking about this is that uh, there are aspects of the world which are robust to these changes in distribution. This is what we want to learn that we'll be able to carry from one to the other one, right? Um, so if we are going to do this, we need to to be able to figure out what are the parts that are conserved and the parts that are going to be just specific to this new little room that I'm discovering. And for this, we need to break down our knowledge about the world in pieces, where there are pieces that are stable, there are pieces that change, and furthermore, we can reuse the pieces that we've discovered before in order to make sense of the new rooms that we enter. Okay. Um, so this notion of breaking down our, our knowledge into small pieces is not something that's like natural to neural nets. The, 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 the usual way of thinking in the, in the deep learning and neural net community is, oh, we have this big homogeneous network and it does everything and it learns everything and it's cool. But we don't get this reuse. I mean, we do some. In fact, this is why deep, le deep learning works. We reuse the features at one level, uh, which can be composed in new ways to get new features at the next level. So we do some of that. Um, but we need more compositionality. I think a lot of the power that machine learning gets in terms of generalization is because in one form or another, we get compositionality effects that, that allow powerful generalization. And deep learning has some forms of compositionality, but we need more. And in particular, this idea of reusing things you've learned in new ways, I think is kind of missing. Okay. So now, let me tell you about a way to think about this issue of different pieces of knowledge that can be reused that I, I got from uh, discussions with uh, a really uh, 
amazing scientist Bernard Shapkov, who's uh, in Germany and uh, uh, his collaborators and, and him wrote this book on causality. And in this book, they introduce a notion uh, which is inspired from physics, the notion of independent mechanisms. So the, the idea of independent mechanisms is that we can describe the world as the composition of independent mechanisms that interact with each other. And what makes them independent is that when you know about one mechanism, it doesn't tell you nothing about another one. All right, so they're independent in an information sense. In an, um, so why do we care about this? Well, we care about this because if we can discover this kind of decomposition of knowledge into pieces that are independent in the information sense, so it's, it's like in a learning sense. In other words, I can't learn about this one by observing this one, then it's a good separation of, of uh, knowledge about the world. Because, why? Because if the world changes as, you know, one of the mechanisms is changed, I don't need to relearn the other ones. So it's like a great modularization principle. If we can discover these independent pieces of knowledge, then it's going to be much easier to recompose them because they'll be sort of robust to changes. And, and in particular, um, if you think about agents in the world, when the changes, so agents that are going to be feeling the effect of changes in the world, these non-stationarities, a lot of those changes are going to be due to the agent itself or other agents doing what people in causality call interventions, what you guys call actions. Um, but they have something more precise in mind when they, they think about interventions. So interventions, they're not just like action in some like uh, action space. They, they, they are, they're, they're saying, oh, I'm going to modify one of these high level variables, like the position of the pointer, right? So, in a way, when, when we design by hand, like a robot and so on, we design the right space of representation for actions so that it, it really is like this. But if you have a, a low-level machine, like I, I just control my muscles, right? I don't control the actual position of this directly. Um, you don't have access to that information, and you'd like a learner to figure it out. So. There is a space of representation, both of perception and action, where the changes in the world correspond to these interventions that only change one abstract thing. So here's an example of an abstract thing that can completely change my perception. I'm going to shut my eyes. One bit. Total change. <laughs> it's black, right? Okay, so. If I were to model the world in pixel space, it would be terrible because it would be very hard for me to explain this change. But, but if I learned that bit that you know, knows that I can shut my eyes and it changes my perception and um, I can explain it in this way, I can plan for it and so on, it's going to be much easier to learn about, you know, to adapt to those kinds of changes where many of these things are happening. All right. so so. The assumption again, I'm going to try to exploit here to deal with changes in distribution is that those changes are due to a localized change. Think of like a single thing has changed, maybe at the limit, um, uh, when you go from one distribution to another. But it's not a change like in KL divergence. So like, I think it's stupid to think of, oh, two distributions or two tasks are similar in KL or something like this. And that's wrong because KL is measuring like in pixel space. And you, I gave you this example that in, in pixel space, I shut my eyes and it's like totally different. So what we want to think about is in, in some kind of ideal abstract space, the change is tiny. Right, so now I'm kind of thinking about those changes in distribution in a way that hopefully can inspire algorithms that take advantage of this assumption in order to A, discover these representations and to use them to do useful things and, and, and um, generalize quickly. So, so that's sort of the visual way of saying this. Uh, I can organize my knowledge about the world in different pieces, and the pieces are connected to each other in some way. Uh, but I want to do it in such a way that when things change in the world, because agents do things and whatever, 
uh, I don't need to change too many things. I have a very robust model where the changes can be very, very localized. And hopefully, if I have the right latent variables, I can do zero-shot learning. I don't need to change anything. I just do inference. In fact, most of the time, that's all we do, right? We figure out what was happening. We're not learning anything. We're just like explaining what's going on. But, but you know, sometimes we have to learn. Um, okay. So here's a concrete example of this that we studied in the paper. Let's say you want to do like a really, really simple job, which is uh, capture the joint distribution between two random variables, A and B. Can't have a simpler machine learning job. And um, you can um, you do it like with a probabilistic model, and you can either decompose it with uh, one conditional and the other marginal, or the other way around. So you have two choices. Which one is good? In theory, if you only consider one distribution, one joint distribution, there is no difference. Both ways are good. But now, if you think of A and B as entities that an agent could intervene on, it's not true anymore. So in particular, if A can be a cause of B and not vice versa, then there's an advantage in decomposing in this way. Uh, no, actually, the other way around. The other way around, sorry. So P of A times P of uh, B given A. Why? Because if there is an intervention, it happens sometimes, P of A is going to be changed by the intervention. Like I'm going to set it to a particular value rather than its natural value. But P of B given A is not going to change. Right? So you see there's a change in distribution and it's localized. And now it's going to be much easier for me to learn about the world if I have the right decomposition because only few things need to be adapted to deal with that change. And I can continue updating my P of B given A because it's, it's valid across all of these samples from different distributions. Um, so if instead I had the wrong causal uh, direction, everything would be mixed up. All of the parameters would contribute to... Um, uh, sorry, if that was a, an intervention like on, on the cause, uh, all of the parameters would be involved in trying to, to uh, account for that. And that's not good. Right? You would have poor transfer and so on. And catastrophic forgetting and uh, you know, continual learning that doesn't work. All of these things are linked to having the wrong knowledge representation. So what can we do? Well, if we know that the good, the, the better models that decompose knowledge more properly have the property that you can recover from changes in distribution faster with the good models, you could say, oh, no, I don't have the good model. Please tell me what the good model is. No, that's not the right way to think. Now I have a measure that tells me that this is a better model than that. And you know what machine learning is about? Optimize it, right? So we can optimize how fast you adapt to changes in distribution. So we can turn this upside down. Where is the slide for this? Um, yeah, I, I don't. Okay, so 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 this is just a, 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 an experiment of with this A and B thing, showing indeed that the the this is the number of examples when the distribution has changed, and this is log likelihood on the joint distribution, and 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 the right model uh, converges much faster early on. And of course, they converge to the same thing eventually. And so we can, we can see the speed of adaptation here as a clue that the, the blue model is the right one. And so we turn that into an objective function. Um, yeah, and uh, you can read more about it in this archive paper, a meta-transfer objective for learning to disentangle causal mechanisms. And there's another ingredient in, uh, in this paper, which is not only we, we want to learn like whether A causes B or B causes A, because it's kind of a trivial question. Well, not trivial, actually. Um, we want to learn what is A and what is B in the first place, because I'm not going to observe these latent variables. I'm going to only observe things like pixels. And what we find is that, well, at least in like the simple scenario that we experimented with, you can also optimize an encoder that figures out what is A and B from a modified version of A and B. So let's say that 
A and B are the real causal variables, and there's some relationship between them, where A is the cause and B is the effect. And then nature plays with us and gives us a mixed up when a XY, where here, say, it's rotated. So now our job is to figure out both an encoder that maps back to the abstract variables where causality is meaningful, and also which is cause and which is effect. Right? So we did that, and it works in 2D. Wow, we got, we got 2D working. Um, we have more working now, but yeah, this was the, the first thing. Um, yeah, so, so, so this is important because this is not something that the, I mean, the, the, the researchers dealing with causality in the past have been thinking about because they, they've been working on things like uh, variables coming from social sciences, uh, medicine, and so on, where the variables are defined by scientists, uh, experts, and they are directly the things that you can control. Like They define things like, oh, the position, and uh, there will be uh, somebody figuring out how to change and, uh, and intervene on these variables. Whereas the robot doesn't have that luxury. It just gets pixels and muscles. So it's really important that we focus, at least the deep learning guys like me, on how we can learn the mapping from low-level uh, things to these abstract variables, both on the perception side and the uh, action side. So, oh yeah, I want to I use this quote from Leon Boutou. He gave a talk at uh, ICML. And I thought it was so great. He said, nature does not shuffle environments. We shouldn't. So what did he mean? What he meant was, if you didn't hear the talk, that there is a lot of information in um, sort of the natural collecting of data, observing in, uh, of data, which comes temporally, that we throw away, usually in machine learning. We take like all the observed data, and we shuffle it because now it's IID and we can just use our, all of our techniques and theory and so on and it just works, right? But we've thrown away useful information. What, what did we throw away? Well, maybe that data corresponded to different phases. Say somebody was collecting first images in Montreal and then they went to Toronto and then they went to Edmonton. Um, well, that is important information, right? That changes in distribution actually contain information. What information? Well, remember I was telling you about, we want to learn about what is stationary, what is stable about the world. Things change when you go from one city to another, and uh, it can be confusing for an algorithm. We'd like these algorithms to generalize to another city, right? Vancouver is coming next. Um, and um, if we lose the information about those changes in cities, uh, it's going to be hard to do that. If we keep track of that, then we could say, well, can we like meta-learn something that when you train on Montreal and Toronto, it generalizes on Edmonton? And then that's more likely to work when we go to Vancouver, right? So that's the idea. There is lots of useful information. And in particular, there is information about causality, because causality is about changes in distribution due to actions or things like actions. So um, I'm going to close on that, I guess. And uh, oh yeah, I have this, uh, this thought about babies. Uh, so infants, infants, they're like really special, right? Because they, they, don't, they don't seem to do much. But they learn a lot, <laughs> right? And so my friend Jan Lecun says, aha, this is evidence that just pure observation is sufficient, and you don't need to worry about action. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's another possibility. That babies observe in time what is going on, and they try to infer the interventions, the actions that happened, uh, that other agents did. So, so babies are not just uh, in a stationary environment. They're they are adults, they're doing things, and sometimes they can influence that, they cry and so on. So, so they actually have actions, and so, so the babies might be building a causal model even though they don't seem to do much intervention in, in their environment. And our experiments actually don't require the learner to know what the intervention was. They just need to know that there was a change. Um, 
it turns out that in our algorithms, if you build, if you, if you allow the agent to do inference over the intervention, so it still doesn't know what it is, but it can guess, right, based on the data, then the learning about causality is much better and faster. And so, yeah, maybe in inference are actually building a, a, a picture of how the world works, even though they don't uh, do that much action. And of course, once they start acting, wow, it gets much more efficient. All right, <laughs> thanks. Yes, Russ. Yeah, studying material, lots of interesting stuff to think about. Yeah, too much, I know. <laughs> I, I get lost. I'm a philosophical question. Oh, I like that. Are you making a set of ontological claims about how the world is, like the world really is inherently smart? Never, never, I never do that. Or are you making epistemological claims? Hey, what? Epistemological. This is a model. <laughs> this is oh, these are big words. Big words are awesome. That the world, that we can model as being effectively. Yes, yes, that's right, that's so, right. So, so the second answer. The words I call typically are ontological claims. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's wrong. Causality is just a tool for our brain to make sense of the world. Yeah, which is not what many philosophers would say, but, but I understand, I understand where you're coming well, from. Well, there's like, there's causality in physics. There's, there's like the underlying causality of the world. Yeah, that's probably like a reasonable thing. But really, as you build AI, what you're thinking about is having this really poor, approximate, coarse model of the world where the causal relationship, you know... Just a, just a deception on our part that makes it useful to look at. Yeah, and then we can use this for taking better decisions at the end of the day, but it doesn't need to be perfect, and it's not. Okay. Thank you. Rich. So, thank you, Josh. That was a great talk, all really interesting things. Uh, I, I think it was, you know, you felt it was a lot, and it was a lot, but but I think many of the people here, I hope my students felt they were prepared for this and that it was uh, actually resonated with, with the way we're thinking. Uh, and it's really interesting that you're thinking very similarly about uh, modeling the world and how you can break it into pieces and that you can find the places to carve the world at. Um, and yet you're, you, have so, you have somewhat you know, different strategies. And so, so one thing that we're using a lot is we're using um, Subproblems as a way to divide things up, as a way to create the component structures. Uh, you mean options, or you mean something else? I mean a subproblem, an independent task. Um, uh, no, I hate the word task. Uh, Me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask bad. <laughs> but but there are um, different things that we work on at different times. Maybe you know we need right. skills to achieve various right, things. Right, right, right. And uh, you didn't really talk very much about subproblems explicitly. Maybe a little bit at the end. Yeah, yeah. So what what do you? I think it's very important. So I think uh, I, so. I mentioned a little bit about representations of uh, policies, right? And, and so I, I want to think in this way, that we have a repertoire of um, skills, options, policies, whatever you want to call it. And, um, and by experimenting over that space, we are building an understanding of how the world works. And somehow we're also able to compose that, that's what options are about. Yeah, uh, this whole thing is important, but of course my focus would be on representation, right? In other words, uh, how do we learn a representation space for these kinds of objects? Uh. Come on! <laughs> <laughs> yes? So I'll ask one question in. So do you think it's fair to say that if we observe non if, if an agent believes the world is non-stationary, yes. then it really is just saying the agent doesn't have an abstract enough representation of the world in his brain? Does not have? Yeah. But if it sees non-stationary, it's just that it doesn't have an it doesn't have a sufficiently abstract view of the world. Um no, so so the way I think about it is we're trying to make it as stationary as possible, right? So we're trying to find out what is conserved, what is robust, what strategies, what representations, what knowledge is robust. But of course, it's never going to be perfect. So we're going to have some adaptation to changes. But we're trying to minimize that by building some, some knowledge representation that becomes, uh, that, that requires the least adaptation. And, and, and when things are nice, like when things are uh, expected, really what it means is we don't need to learn. We, we can just explain what's going on. But that's the limit. 
usually we have some learning to do. So, so non there is non-stationarity, right? Did you mention that uh, we might be able to learn magical encoder? Yes, yes, I the know. magical encoder, yeah, yeah. That's my life mission. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Are you proposing that we can just learn a fixed encoder? And if not, then... A fixed encoder? What is that? I don't know what fixed means. Like no learning, you mean? You can meta-learn an encoder. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. The encoder is meta-learned. But is the reference, as you learn new things, you might have to update your encoder as well. Right? Yeah, but hopefully not too much. So uh, apparently there's something like this going on in your brain, that different areas, like your visual system, for example, especially the lower levels, they don't like to change too quickly. Mm -hmm. so, so learning in the brain is going on at different timescales. So the, the slow timescales would be like very stationary information, and then the fast scales would be I just give you a new rules of a, ga a game we're going to play together and you can use it right away right? so it seems to me that and I think you had it in one of your visuals that there is two kinds of attention going on like one, one at the bottom level something like that visual attention yeah 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 yeah, yeah. you talk you focus like the, the, the attention you use were mostly inside the one, yeah yeah so in the internal attention yeah right right so would that also play a role in like how you're... Well, I'm mostly thinking about the second kind, yeah, yeah, the yeah. internal attention. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's also memory, which is a kind of attention, and people have been using extended memory networks uh, using attention mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very, very related, uh, memory and attention, because information retrieval from memory is the basically a form of attention. The, the, the sensory one? Huh? The no, the, that's also internal, right? But is it related to the internal attention or the sensory attention? It's internal attention. Memory yeah. is internal. Yeah. Yes? You said in your causal work that you don't need to know what the intervention was, you just need to know that there was a change. But is it even that kind of a strong requirement? Um, something is always changing. Right, so of course in our experiments we set it up, it's artificial data and we, we set it up so that there are changes. Each episode is coming from a different distribution corresponding to a different intervention. Um, but yeah, I think the really good question which we haven't addressed is we're not given explicitly those different uh, episodes where somebody knows this is one distribution and then this is a different one. Somehow we have to figure it out. And maybe it changes rapidly, maybe not. Um, so that's part of uh, what an agent would need, which we don't know yet how to do. But I think machine learning has built a lot of tools in the toolbox to help do things like inference of latent variables. One thing you stressed is that um, it's really, uh, as to motivate the work, is insufficiencies of the normal way, uh, normal results of, of uh, supervised deep learning. Right. Is that uh, we get catastrophic interference, we don't generalize well, and you know... You we don't generalize well out of distribution. Out of distribution, good. And and I, it's really important, you know, that for you to say that, because you're such a... Oh, I keep repeating it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, is, can you give us, like, is there a good citation for that presents that point of view in an authoritative way, like maybe you've written up a good dis good argument for it that we could cite? Uh, <laughs> uh, with, uh, absolutely. Um, this is the latest thing I wrote that uh, makes that point. Um, and hopefully more papers will come out with the same philosophy. Um, yeah, I think it's really important that the, the deep learning community start thinking about all this because if we don't, then we're stuck with systems that have fairly limited uh, generalization capabilities, and, and especially of the out-of-distribution type, which people in industry actually care about. Because you train your system on data from city XYZ, and you want it to work on city uh, ABC. So it, it really is an issue. Um, from the beginning, the argument was that the backprop would let us find representations. Yes. And I would always say that that, that although you know we celebrated that, that maybe it hasn't really done that. 
Doesn't, doesn't give um, okay, so so maybe you're 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 you were expecting too much from backprop. So first of all, I use the word backprop just to mean the algorithm that computes the gradients. But really, what you mean is the architecture with some hidden layers, and you're optimizing by gradient descent, some sort of objective function. In a way, what I'm proposing is still backprop. I'm going to I'm still optimizing, and I still have hidden layers and so on. It's just that. The training objective, the structure of the architecture is now different, and, and, and the thinking behind it refers to things like agents and environments and stuff, right? So, but you're right, the vanilla MLP with supervised learning is not going to cut it. Yeah. Russ, I think you had a question earlier. Well, just, this sounds, a lot of these ideas sound so familiar to us old people. Like <laughs> I'm glad. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So I used to despise classical AI, yeah. and yeah, and now <laughs> no. <laughs> well, maybe, but 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 I think we should give credit yeah. to all of the thought that's gone in the in the good old-fashioned AI. Yeah. Because they were trying to solve a hard problem, maybe they didn't have the right tools. I think now we have better tools that may really ch make a difference. And they weren't thinking about learning. Thinking about thinking. Well, that was the main thing that was missing. <laughs> they still talk about having frame axioms, right? That I changed this, and the frame axioms, everything it didn't change. All the yes. Scripts, yes. So, so again, just, it resonates. Totally, it? totally. So that's why I started with the system one, system two thing. Okay. System two is. Good old-fashioned AI. I mean, that's but yeah, what the, that's what they're trying to to do. Yes. Okay. Well, this has been really good. And if there are no more immediate questions, we're we're kind of over time, and it's been really good. Thank you so much. Josh. Thank you.